Hi, my name is Stephanie Milam. I'm the Deputy Project Scientist for Planetary Science uh, on the James Webb Space Telescope. And today I'm going to talk to you about some of the solar system science we're expecting to do with James Webb when it launches. The James Webb Space Telescope is comprised of three main components. One is the most noticeable feature of James Webb, which is this beautiful gold hexagon mirror um, that stands at actually about six and a half meters in diameter. The other main component of the spacecraft that's probably one of the other most noticeable features is this large sun shield, um, which is this funny purple structure that you see here. And beneath that sun shield is the spacecraft bus. So this is where um, we actually have our communications, our solar array, and also control the spacecraft and the telescope with where it's pointing. But the heart of James Webb is actually behind this beautiful gold mirror, and it's called the Instrument Integrated Science Instrument Module. This is where our four instruments are actually housed, and this is the heart of James Webb. So the four instruments are actually include a mid-infrared instrument, a near-infrared spectrograph, a near-infrared camera, and a fine guidance sensor that also has a near-infrared imager and slitless spectrograph. This is where all the science of James Webb is actually acquired, and this is where new discoveries will be made. The James Webb Space Telescope has four themes um, that it was built and designed for, one of which is planetary systems and the origin of life. The main goal of this theme is to determine the physical and chemical properties of solar systems, including our own, and where the building blocks of life may be present in the universe. But because of James Webb's funny structure, it actually limits how much of the solar system we can actually see with this telescope. Uh, as I mentioned, our sun shield actually prevents the sun and the Earth's radiation from warming up the, the main optics of the telescope and the instruments. So because of this and this funny structure, we cannot point the telescope towards the inner solar system. So we can't see anything sort of at Earth or within that boundary. But the good news is, is we can see everything sort of from Mars on outward. But this includes small bodies such as near-Earth asteroids, asteroids themselves, and main belt comets, and comets that come within to the inner solar system. Unfortunately, most objects in the solar system, though, are extremely bright. James Webb was designed to detect the farthest stars and galaxies of the universe. And what we're trying to do within the solar system is look at some of the brightest objects in the sky, Mars being one of them in the infrared. What you're seeing here, though, is some science that we actually want to be able to do with James Webb and follow up on very long-lived projects um, that are quite challenging to do from the ground. The map that you see, the colored map that's overlaid on Mars that's rotating on the right hand side is actually a methane map that was acquired with the Keck telescope on Mauna Kea in Hawaii. This map actually took a number of months to acquire due to limitations of observing from the ground, including things like only being able to observe at night, um, limits on weather and clouds, and as well as competition for obtaining time on these large telescopes. Even as such, we're able to do these things with quite sensitive limits from the ground. But again, it is quite challenging. With James Webb, we have access to not only water and methane, as well as other organics, but even molecules that we cannot actually observe from the ground. Additionally, with the sensitivity of James Webb Space Telescope, we'll be able to acquire maps like this, not in the months that it took from the ground, but within a matter of minutes. With our instrumentation that you can see on the left-hand side, on the lower left, uh, the near-infrared spectrometer has a slit uh, capable of actually obtaining slits to step across the, the disk of Mars and map out these sorts of molecules, including things like water, methane, and organics, within an hour or less. So we'll get instantaneous maps of the surface of Mars and its atmosphere 
Some of the maps that we are expecting to look at include things like surface properties, nighttime chemistry, how dust in the surface actually vary with time and season. The James Webb Space Telescope is also going to be able to probe the outer solar system with unique sensitivity. What you see here is one of our ice giants, Uranus, and overlaid on top of it is the mid-infrared um, integral field unit field of views. Uh, this, this particular instrument looks like it was actually designed to map the surface of Uranus and Neptune. Uh, not only do they fit perfectly with the full disk of these objects, but you can also see that we'll be able to acquire uh, information on the rings and satellites with unprecedented sensitivity of James Webb. The James Webb Space Telescope gives us access to the near and thermal and mid infrared. This is access and sensitivity to these outer planets that we've never had before. So we'll be able to probe certain areas of the atmosphere that are inaccessible with other facilities, such as the Hubble Space Telescope, or even with the resolution that we weren't able to uh, achieve with the Spitzer Space Telescope. One of the hot topics right now, though, in planetary science are ocean worlds. With the Hubble Space Telescope, we actually were able to, to detect gas coming from the, the surface of one of these ocean worlds, the satellite Europa. And that is what you're seeing here with these blue sort of clouds coming from this the disk of this satellite. Overlaid on top of it is the Near Infrared Spectrometer's Interval Field Unit. So you can see each one of these little squares will be able to obtain the full near infrared spectra and actually map not only the composition of these plumes, but also the surface of the satellite or planet of interest. With this resolution, we will be able to determine not only what, how much water is coming from these plumes, but also if there's any other organic material, including things like methane, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, or other organics. Also, as these plumes occur, they may be causing surface features to change as well. So not only mapping the plumes themselves and acquiring their spectra is of interest, but also monitoring how the surface is varied with time. The real bread and butter for James Webb, though, in the solar system is actually the outer reaches of the solar system in the Kuiper Belt. This is where small primitive bodies actually exist and are considered to be relics of when the solar system actually formed. Not only do they include some of our favorite uh, small bodies, um, including things like Pluto and some of the other minor planets, but it also includes a wide range of these objects that vary in size down to tens of kilometers in size. And of course, JWST will also be studying planets out of our solar system. So those planets that have been discovered around other stars in our galaxy. With the wavelengths of the James Webb Space Telescope, we have access to really start studying what the composition of the atmosphere of these exoplanets actually are and determine whether or not they could potentially be habitable and or have the right composition to sustain life. With that, I want to thank you for your time and please send along your questions. You can contact us through social media or find us through any of our web pages. Thank you.